In today's video, nine more habits that beginner cyclists must avoid to improve their safety, their performance, and their comfort while out on the bike. This tutorial is a follow-on video from one I made a number of months ago that you can see up here, where I had a bunch of great comments telling me other habits that beginner cyclists must avoid. I've put them all into a list. I've added a couple more of my own. Let's get straight into it. This is point number one. Avoid cornering with your inside foot down. When you're going around a corner, your inside foot is on the same side as the direction in which you are cornering. For example, if you're turning left, your inside foot would be your left foot, and if you're turning right, your inside foot would be your right foot. I did discuss avoiding putting your inside foot down in the last video to do with bike stability, but another and equally as important, if not more important reason to avoid putting your inside foot down when cornering is so that you don't drag your pedal on the ground and end up crashing. It's very easy to touch your pedal on the road if you lean over too far while in a corner and that will reduce traction in the rear wheel and have you end up slipping out and falling off. By placing your weight on your outside pedal as you curve around a corner, you'll keep that inside pedal away from the road and you'll also stabilize your bike in a better way. Being able to corner correctly and put your weight on your outside foot no matter whether you're turning left or right is a very important skill to learn and by learning this basic skill you'll end up as a safer cyclist. Some of the most common crashes that I have seen in cycling are to do with the fact that the rear wheel of the rider in front overlaps with the front wheel of the rider behind. The reason to make sure to avoid overlapping wheels with the rider in front of you is that if you rub your front wheel on their rear wheel and you can't get your wheel out from behind their wheel quick enough, you won't be able to steer out of the situation and you will end up crashing. Although it's obviously nice to have a chat to the rider next to you if you're in a social circumstance or on a bunch ride, it is very easy to have a lapse in concentration and find that you've drifted up too close to the rider that you're drafting and ending up overlapping wheels with them. This heightens the chances of you crashing if they do make a sudden movement left or right. A quick tip on how to avoid overlapping wheels with the rider in front of you is to pay attention to not only what's happening with the rider directly in front of you, but also any riders in front of them as well. Just like driving a car and looking further up the road to see what's going on and to anticipate what might happen, it's important when in a bunch to anticipate what's gonna happen a few riders in front of you so that you can avoid overlapping wheels and avoid any of the issues that come with riding in close proximity to other cyclists. This leads me on to point number three. It's very important to carry your own spares and know how to use them while out on the bike. You can either use a saddlebag, a tool bottle in your bike, or put your spares in your jersey pockets, but it's incredibly important to carry spares and know how to use them so that you're not relying on others while you're out on the road. The spares that I carry in my saddlebag are two spare tubes, a set of tire levers, a spare tool, two CO2 canisters with a CO2 inflator head, and also sometimes if I'm doing a long ride, I'll carry a pump with me as well. On top of this, it's super important to know how to use the tools and the spares that you've got with you to get yourself out of any situation that might arise on the road. For example, knowing how to fix a broken chain, how to replace a punctured tube, or how to tighten any of the bolts on your bike that may have come loose and might make your bike either unsafe or feel a little bit weird. There are a whole heap of YouTube tutorials out there where you can learn all sorts of skills to help you look after your bike. So I do recommend watching a bunch of them, learning some of the basic skills and never needing to rely on others while you're out cycling. Now it's very easy to look at what's going on on TV when the Tour de France is on and thinking I need one of those. But the reality is race bikes are for racers, endurance bikes are for endurance riders, and city and flat bar bikes are great for simple recreational riders. Race bikes have more aggressive geometry and often a harsher ride. They're great for people looking at doing some serious training in racing with speed as their primary focus. But for a majority of riders, that is not going to be the case. Most sports cyclists are gonna fit into the middle category of endurance bikes. Not only are endurance bikes suited to long rides due to their slightly more relaxed position and comfort focused geometry, but they will also often offer a larger tire clearance, a more stable wheelbase length and less twitchy handling. If you're the kind of rider that likes going out on weekends, likes to ride with their mates, does the odd Grand Fondo or long ride, and likes to go on cycling holidays every so often, you'll find buying a bike that better suits your actual needs is going to be more beneficial than simply buying the same bikes that we all see being raced on TV. Cross chaining is when you're either using the smallest chainring on the front with the smallest cogs on the cassette on the back, or the opposite, using the largest chainring on the front while using the largest cogs on the cassette on the back. Cross chaining will have the chain rubbing on the edge of the teeth on the cassette, creating extra friction, noise, and ultimately wear on your drivetrain. The most efficient drivetrains operate when the chain is running in a perfectly straight line, or at least close to that. So you want to avoid cross chaining to avoid that inefficiency of doing so. A good tip to avoid cross 
fast chaining is that when you're in the big chain ring on the front, avoid going any further up the cassette than the third largest cog. And conversely, when you're in the small chain ring on the front, avoid going any further down the cassette than the third smallest cog. It is important when you are riding along to anticipate what's coming up and select the right gear before you get there. For example, if you're riding along the flat and you come to a short, sharp, steep hill, don't wait until you're halfway up the climb and pedaling at a cadence of 30 before you shift into the small chain ring on the front. Shift into the correct gear at the bottom of the climb, that's usually going to be the small chain ring, and move your way up a couple of cogs at the back to get yourself ready for what's to come, and you'll avoid having that extra tension on the chain while you're climbing, and then having that all release when you suddenly shift gears on the front. Something else to be aware of with cross chaining like I am now is that if you are in the big chain ring on the front and you're in the biggest cog on the cassette at the back and you come to a stop, say for example at a set of traffic lights, if you pedal backwards slightly you're going to find the chain drops off that big chain ring and it might get lodged in the bottom bracket and you won't be able to get it out. This is a hazard if you are stopped in traffic and it's something that I see happen in beginner bunches all the time. I'll give you a live demo of what I mean right now. Now it's very easy given we're coming into winter here in the Northern Hemisphere to overdress when it's cold outside, but find that when you go outside and actually ride, you heat up and need to take off all these layers. It's really important not only to layer correctly when you go outside, but also to look at what the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature are and understand how to dress correctly for those temperatures. The system that I use for dressing for winter rides is I check the temperature before I leave, not just for the start of the ride, but mainly for the middle of the ride and the majority of the time that I'm going to be riding for. I then put on the correct amount of layers so then I'm a little bit chilly when I roll out, knowing that I'm gonna warm up after a little bit of riding, and then I'll be perfectly dressed for the rest of the ride. Cycling is a sport where you can get incredibly hot when you go uphill, and then incredibly cold when you go downhill just a short time later. As you are climbing in winter, I always recommend unzipping a couple of layers to give yourself some extra airflow and make sure you don't get too hot, and then doing those up by the time you get to the top of the climb, so when you start descending, you're not a sweaty mess, and you're not cooling down too much. Now I did record this part of the video without properly considering just how cold it gets in some of the more northern parts of Europe, in the UK, and of course in the northern states of the US. If you are riding in freezing temperatures, please don't go out and get cold. That is not my intention to make you guys cold. But if you are new to cycling and you are finding it difficult to know how to dress in winter, you might find some of this advice useful. If you would like to know the complete system that I use for dressing in winter, drop a comment down below and tell me so because I am thinking of making a video about it and I'd love to know if that's something that you guys think you would find useful. Avoid overdressing in winter, and when you go out the door and then come home having dressed perfectly, you'll feel great for it. Avoid always riding in social circumstances. Now it's true that cycling is an incredibly social sport and we all enjoy riding to catch up with our mates. But if you're looking to improve your fitness, social rides won't always help that as much as some solo time in the wind. By riding alone, not only will you be able to focus 100% on any structured training or intervals that you've given yourself, but you'll also find that you're in the wind 100% of the time. This is going to mean that even without any structured training or intervals, you're going to get fitter and stronger faster. The other great thing about integrating some solo rides into your riding program is that when those social rides do come along, you are gonna find you enjoy them that little bit more. Now tip number eight, and one that is probably my favorite of this entire video, and one that I've spent the most amount of time learning myself, is to avoid going too hard at the start of every climb you do. Not only do you wanna learn how to pace your effort for the entirety of the ride that you're doing, but also pace your effort over climbs to make sure that you finish each one just as strong as you started it. This will not only teach you to have better control over the way you use your energy throughout a ride, but it's also likely to help you get up every climb in the fastest manner possible. A good tip that I have for pacing is to try to negative split each kilometer of the climbs that you're doing. Start the climb easier than you think you should, but gradually increase the pace as the climb goes on. If you do this correctly, you should reach the top of the climb having perfectly managed your effort, and then you can recover comfortably as you descend down the other side. By negative splitting your climbs, as I call it, or simply trying to get faster and faster as you go up the climb, you'll find you have to start the climb that little bit easier, but then unconsciously you'll also begin to pace your riding and your climbing that little bit better because you'll understand how to use your energy in a more efficient way. I've used the word efficiency a bunch of times in this point, but that's what we're aiming for here. By pacing your climbing and your rides efficiently, you'll find that you get to the end of them feeling like an absolute champion.
Okay, now point number nine is this, and it's probably not a habit to avoid, but more a habit to get into, and that is simply being into the habit of riding your bike. As James Clear says in his book, Atomic Habits, every action you take is a vote for the person that you wanna become. To become the best rider that you can be, you not only need to see cycling as an activity that you do, but see being a cyclist as part of who you are. Eventually you'll find that cycling becomes as much a part of your identity as the other aspects of who you are. And eventually when you miss a day of riding, you'll feel like you've missed a key part of your daily routine. Like getting good at anything in life, there is no quick shortcut to becoming the best cyclist that you can be. You simply have to keep at it for years and years and years. I've been riding for the last 15 years and I'm still finding that I'm learning things along the way. But one thing I can assure you is that if you keep up with it consistently, you will continue to grow as a cyclist. You'll get better, you'll enjoy it more, and you'll end up in a better place as a result. I hope you guys have got something out of this video. Please make sure to whack a like on it if you have. And if you enjoyed the style of this video, make sure to subscribe for more. I'll see you guys all in another episode of Tristan Take Video very, very soon. Alrighty, thank you.